Louisiana residents and businesses uh, for the work that they've been doing um, and especially for those individuals who have been complying with our mitigation measures that we've implemented to date. But especially I want to thank all of our health care workers across the state of Louisiana, particularly down in Region 1 around New Orleans and Jefferson Parish, uh, which obviously has the greatest amount of cases. I also want to thank all the first responders. You know, our health care workers and first responders are absolutely uh, true heroes. Um, and just looking ahead, um, and this applies to everybody, um, again, I can tell you that this emergency is going to get worse before it gets better. How much worse, we don't know, but what we do know is we can influence how much worse it gets. And that's what this press conference is about because the bottom line is we're in a race against time when it comes to this coronavirus and its rapid spread in Louisiana. The mitigation measures that we have in place and that we will continue to uh, put in place will not be effective if our people and our businesses don't actively participate, if they don't comply, if they don't stay at home unless it's absolutely necessary to move out. As you know already, we've closed public schools, bars, casinos, movie theaters, gyms, and fitness centers. We've limited restaurants uh, and asked government employees to work remotely. We've asked private businesses to allow the maximum number of workers to work remotely. But quite simply put, there is more that we must do. Today, I'm issuing a stay-at-home order for the entire state of Louisiana which will become effective tomorrow, Monday, March 23rd at 5 p.m. However, and I want to make this explicit, the people of Louisiana who are able to do so certainly should not wait till tomorrow uh, in order to self-isolate. The time is now. If possible, as Sanjay Gupta and others have recommended, behave as if you know you have the coronavirus. Self-isolate. Keep those distances. Don't engage in unnecessary contact with others. And certainly don't do it with those who are in the high-risk group, those who are 65 and older and those who have underlying chronic health conditions. So this order will close additional non-essential businesses, but will keep things like grocery stores, pharmacies, and other businesses open that are providing critical services. Uh, restaurants will still be allowed to have takeout drive through and carry out meals. And for a complete listing of what is closed and what may remain open, I will refer you to the order itself, uh, which is available online at gov.louisiana.gov, gov.louisiana.gov. However, the following non-essential businesses shall be closed to the public, and they are specifically mentioned in the order. All places of public amusement, whether indoors or outdoors, including but not limited to locations with amusement rides, carnivals, amusement parks, water parks, trampoline parks, aquariums, zoos, museums, arcades, fairs, pool halls, children's play centers, playgrounds, theme parks, any theaters, concert, music halls, adult entertainment venues, racetracks, and other similar businesses. All personal care and grooming businesses, including but not limited to barbershops, beauty salons, nail salons, spas, massage parlors, tattoo parlors, and other similar businesses are closed. All malls are closed except for stores in a mall that have a direct outdoor entrance and exit and that provide essential services and products as provided by the CISA, the CISA guidelines. And by the way, CISA is the U.S. Department of Homeland Security Cybersecurity and Infrastructure Security Agency. Uh, and it will become very clear to everyone, we took the guidelines from uh, this agency as far as what essential business infrastructure looks like that has to remain open and who those essential workers are uh, to keep them open. Businesses closed to the public to this, uh, pursuant to this provision shall not be prohibited from conducting necessary activities such as payroll, cleaning services, maintenance, or upkeep as necessary, but they are closed to the public. And general businesses fall into one of three categories. Closed businesses, which I just listed. Essential businesses, which can remain open, including grocery stores, pharmacies, and many government facilities. Critical manufacturing businesses, utilities, financial services, to name a few. Again, this is based on the federal government's CISA recommendations, which we will share uh, and which we are, are uh, attaching to uh, this order. The third category of businesses that aren't considered essential but aren't 
closed um, uh, by this order. And these businesses, like professional service providers or non-essential retail, can only be open with essential employees and if there are fewer than 10 people in the business. Uh, my order limits public gatherings to no more than 10 people. And yes, for the journalists in the room, we do consider your work to be essential. As I've said, the state of Louisiana relied on federal Homeland Security uh, guidance in its decision-making process. We have also relied upon health providers, uh, trends, actions being taken in other states, and both published guidance and advice from our federal partners. I do want to thank both Vice President Pence and Dr. Anthony Fauci for taking time to speak with me personally as I contemplated uh, this particular decision. And I know that all of this may be overwhelming for some of you to hear. Please know that it's a difficult decision for me to make, and I do not take this action lightly. But there are some basic facts that we just simply cannot deny or ignore. Two weeks ago today, there were zero confirmed cases of COVID-19 in Louisiana. One week ago, last Sunday morning, we had 91 confirmed cases. As of this morning, we now have 837 confirmed cases and 20 deaths. So that's a 10-time increase in seven days. While largely concentrated in Orleans and Jefferson Parishes, COVID-19 cases are now in 36 parishes. So spread has taken place across the state. I have seen a number of projections as to when we could run out of health care capacity in Louisiana, anywhere from 7 to 10 days, based on the rate of spread, the percentage of the ill population that needs to be hospitalized, the average length of the hospitalization, and whether that hospitalization is in an acute care bed or in an intensive care bed, and then, of course, obviously how much in the intervening time period that we are able to surge our capacity. Now, I've said this before, uh, but there is no reason to believe that we won't be the next Italy. What happened in Italy is they started too late. People didn't socially distance. They thought they could just focus on that part of the country where the outbreak was heaviest rather than on the entire country. And what the world learned as a result is that you have to act fast and in places that may not look like they have a problem yet. So if you look at this graphic up here right now, you will see that the state of Louisiana currently has the nation's third highest number of cases per capita. We are behind New York State, Washington State, and we are ahead of New Jersey. So obviously, this is concerning to me because healthcare infrastructure is sized to meet the population. So it's not the raw cases the raw number of cases in Louisiana that are most concerning to me is that per capita caseload. Secondly, I'd like to show the next chart. Study out of the University of Louisiana Lafayette. We have the fastest growth rate in confirmed cases in the world over the first 13 days, right here in Louisiana. I'm going to say that again so people can understand what I just said. In the last two weeks, our growth rate has been faster than any state or country in the world. This is why it matters. Would you show the next one, please? When we talk about flattening the curve, this is what we're talking about. Right now, Louisiana is depicted in purple. We don't have as much time under our belt since the spread started, and so our line doesn't continue out for as many days, but you can see the trajectory we are on. It's not much different than Spain or Italy. It's not much different than South Korea. But if you will look, South Korea started to bend the curve right in this point. That's about seven days from now. And so if we want to flatten the curve, we have to take more aggressive mitigation measures right now and limit our social contact. There's no other way to do this. So that's why it's urgent that we take this action today. You know, it's, it's sort of like 
um, a slow moving ocean liner or tanker on the Mississippi River, you've got to start churning way ahead of where you think you need to in order to get to your desired destination. So we've got to take action now. And it's especially true since testing and positive cases lag for some period of time after the personal contact through mitigation actually slows down. So we, we, we just have to act now. And I'm, I want to tell you, we can get past this. But we're going to have to take these mitigation measures seriously. One of the core missions that we've been working on every day is to increase ICU capacity and other medical capacity in our hospitals for surge beds, for ventilators, and so forth. Uh, and doing this throughout the state. And with the within the next two weeks, we expect to bring online over 200 new ICU beds and with more coming in the following weeks. And we are stepping up this effort as fast as we possibly can. Hospitals and medical providers should not perform any elective surgeries based on an order that has already been issued from the state health officer. We are pushing to get more personal protective equipment called PPE for our critical health care workers. And we simply cannot afford to use PPE or hospital bed space for elective procedures right now. And I apologize for that. I know that people have been waiting for these procedures, uh, but now it's quite simply is not the right time. By the way, I am asking, I am urging any and every health care provider, if you're not operating, you should immediately contact your local hospital and provide it with any PPE that you have, including masks and gloves. All of this work we're doing where the health I'm sorry, with health care partners will be insufficient if people do not follow our advice to stay home to prevent the spread of this particular virus. Every single person in Louisiana has a role to play, and we need you to play that role. Today I'm also announcing that all state government offices statewide will be closed to the public. However, the essential work of government will continue. State workers will receive specific guidance from their agency heads. And to be clear, you can still do the following. Go to the grocery, convenience, or warehouse store. Go to the pharmacy to pick up medications and other health care necessities. Go to medical appointments. Of course, check with your doctor or provider first, and wherever possible, see your care provider through telehealth rather than actually getting out and going to the doctor's office. You can go to a restaurant to pick up, take out, uh, or delivery or drive through meals. You can care for or support a friend or a family member. You can take a walk, ride your bike, hike, jog, go out into nature for exercise, just encouraging you uh, to keep at least six feet between you and others. You can walk your pets. You can take them to the veterinary uh, clinic if necessary. You can help someone to get necessary supplies. You can receive deliveries from any business which delivers. And just a note on grocery shopping. As I've said before, our supply chain will keep working. These stores are going to stay open. Their workers are essential workers. The transportation and logistics system necessary to support our stores will remain in place and active. So there is no, read for you to, no need for you to rush out and hoard groceries or to buy more than you need. Please buy one week's worth of groceries at a time. However, you should not go to work unless you are providing essential services as defined by this order. Visit friends and family if there is no urgent need. Maintain less than six feet of distance from you and others when you go out. Or visit a loved one in the hospital, nursing home, skilled nursing facility, or other residential care facility except for limited exceptions as provided on the facility websites. Now, I know there are a lot of rumors out there about closing our borders or restricting travel between parishes or sending out the Louisiana National Guard and so forth. Those rumors are not true. They've never been based in anything that was factual. And I'm encouraging people not to spread, not to start, not to disseminate uh, rumors. And I am encouraging people to get their information as best they can uh, from legitimate sources. You can, you can 
look at this order for yourself. Uh, go to the website that I mentioned before. Uh, follow mainstream media. Uh, they will be giving you uh, up-to-date and accurate information. Many people will ask how this stay-at-home stay order is different than what we already have in place. Well, this order expands the businesses that are closed statewide and will dramatically reduce the number of people who will be out and about. It should dramatically reduce the frequency with which people come into contact with others. That is how this virus is spread. It states explicitly that non-essential workers should not be going to work, period. However, telecommuting, working from home, is obviously encouraged and should be maximized. Right now, we know it's critical for our people to obviously have the most accurate information possible. And we have all been focused on the testing and the testing results and so forth every single day. And they've, there's, I think, been multiple updates every day. Uh, as more testing comes online with more commercial and private providers and a greater number of tests, it takes some period of time for that information to come in, to be aggregated, to be sorted, and to make sure that it's accurate. We still have to get that information back to the providers who are ordering the testing so that they can give it to their patients and so forth. And so I have decided that we are not going to keep uh, asking our lab to disseminate this information twice a day. So we're going to go to once a day at 12 noon uh, where we will be updating. This is what the CDC does. It's what other states are doing. And quite frankly, um, uh, the, the pace that we've been going at over the last number of days is just not sustainable. Uh, I do want to thank uh, Dr. B.U., who's here with me today to answer any specific questions as it relates to testing. And by extension, everybody who works at the Department of Health and, and Public Health and over at the lab for the work uh, that they have been doing. Uh, we have now had more than 2,000 commercial lab tests reported to the state. Uh, that is great. We like knowing what we're dealing with. Uh, the worst thing is to be uh, in the dark as to what's going on out there. Um, but just as point of reference, because I was talking about South Korea earlier and how they were able to flatten the curve, quite frankly, their testing was much more robust, much earlier, and they were able to get a grip on a lot more people in public who were actually positive for COVID-19. They then engaged in isolation uh, and contact tracing at a level that we simply have not been able to do because our testing, uh, quite frankly, not just here in Louisiana, but around the country, was inadequate to the task in terms of, of the capacity and the throughput. And it is ramping up, and I'm thankful for that. Uh, and over the coming days and weeks, I think we're going to see it expand uh, much more. But I say this because if we want to flatten the curve the way that South Korea did here, we're going to have to have people who are isolating who don't know whether they're, they're positive or not. And so our actions, our mitigation measures are going to have to be a proxy for testing that was insufficient. And if anything, we're going to have to have more isolation uh, in order to be able to, to flatten, uh, flatten the curve. Uh, again, the reason this is important is we don't want everybody being infected all at once to then create an immediate and overwhelming demand on limited health care resources. We need to flatten the curve, extend the duration of this emergency, uh, and expand our capacity to deliver health care all at the same time. In closing, I'd like to make a plea to the people of Louisiana on behalf of of our healthcare workers who are out there on the front lines fighting COVID-19. And also on behalf of our brothers and sisters and mothers and grandfathers, all of those individuals who are especially vulnerable because of their age or because of their underlying chronic health conditions. Stay home every minute that you can. Keep yourselves isolated when you whether or not you have symptoms, but certainly if you have a fever, if you have a cough or, or so forth, make sure that, that you are not interacting with other people. The fewer people that we have to treat, the less chance that healthcare workers are, are going to be overwhelmed and the less chance that obviously we're going to have unnecessary spread to the most vulnerable population. 
the less masks we're going to need, the less ventilators we're going to need, the less hospital beds, the less nurses and doctors and so forth. I know that there is anxiety. I know that there can be confusion. We need to be resolute. We need to be focused. We need to be determined. And we need to beat this. We will. We're going to get through this. But we're going to do it because we're going to comply with these directives. There's nothing that we as Louisianans cannot accomplish if we work together. So let's be selfless. Let's be good neighbors. Let's be good Louisianans. And let's continue to lift one another up in this state up, our country up, uh, in prayer. Uh, and with that, I will take your questions. Yes, sir. Uh, Governor, what actions are going to be taken for those found to be traveling for non-essential businesses or, business or um, items? Well, for, first of all, um, I, I would hope and pray with the information that I just went over and what's immediately obvious to anybody who's tuning in to CNN or Fox News or, or any of these news channels, uh, that the situation will be enough to get people to comply with what these orders are. Um, obviously, we have an enforcement issue if, because we, we know that there are still tens of thousands, pr hundreds of thousands of essential workers in those uh, businesses that are deemed critical uh, infrastructure by CISA and those workers who are deemed critical who are still going to have to move about every day. We know that people are going to have to periodically go to the grocery store, to the pharmacy, to the bank. Uh, they're going to have to go fill up their cars and so forth and so on. So, so there's going to be travel out on the road. We're not going to be doing checkpoints and asking people to tell us why they're out and about, but that doesn't mean we're not uh, asking for their cooperation. Uh, you know, when you have an order uh, of this magnitude, quite simply, if the people of Louisiana demand that we enforce it before they honor it, we're in deep trouble. We are in deep trouble. So I'm asking people to be good citizens like you have never been before uh, over the, the course of this time. And, and um, I, th I think I mentioned this. If I didn't, I apologize. We expect uh, right now that this order, in fact, it will stay in place um, uh, through Sunday, uh, March, I'm sorry, April the 12th. April the 12th. It expires uh, on Monday the 13th unless it is extended. Yes, sir. Uh, how many cases and deaths do we currently have confirmed at Lambda House in New Orleans? I'm going to ask, um, and, and I, I don't, didn't get that information before we walked out. I'm going to ask Dr. Bu to come up and answer the question. But I do want to address something real quick about Lambda House. Uh, we know that the coronavirus uh, was in Lambeth House, in particular in the independent living side, long before we knew it was in Louisiana and they knew or should have known it was in their facility. And this is a very, very tough situation. Uh, but Lambeth House has always been an excellent facility. Uh, I know that the, the uh, administrator there and the staff um, have always done their absolute dead level best uh, to take care of their patients. Um, and, and they have cooperated in every single way with the Louisiana Department of Health and the Office of Public Health and the epidemiological team that uh, CDC sent in uh, that actually uh, took up residence in that home in order to, to manage this. Um, the, other, the other thing that I would say is we're still inside that 14 day window uh, where all of the exposures that, that have come to light were probably exposures that happened before any actions were, were taken, that they knew to take any actions. Uh, but, but since the very first case uh, manifested itself in that home, uh, the folks at Lambeth House have done everything that they've been asked to do. And it is a very, very tough situation. Um, and I just, I just want the, the administrator and I want those health care workers everybody associated with Lambeth House to know that that's been the information that I have been getting from day number one. Uh, but but it, is, it is a tough situation. My heart goes out to them and to the families of all of those uh, residents. And so, Dr. B, if you would come up and 
So uh, as of the information that I have this morning, and again, uh, labs change over time, we have still 24 confirmed cases at Lambeth House, and we know of seven confirmed deaths of residents of Lambeth House. Um, as, as the governor said, you know, we're still within that 14-day period, so we'll continue to, to have more information come. While I have you up there, uh, the FEMA has been reporting that we have at least seven nursing homes that have been affected. Uh, do we, can you tell me which the, what the homes are, what seven? So we have uh, individuals who may have been at a nursing home at the time that they're diagnosed. We don't count a nursing home as a cluster until we have multiple cases there. But what I can tell you is that my team, anytime somebody is identified as having been in a nursing home, has a special team that contacts that, uh, that nursing home and works with them on the same kind of work that we were doing uh, with Lambeth House. And, and we continue to be in daily contact with Lambeth House and daily contact with any other <coughs> facility that has people with symptoms. We even start at the point of symptoms. We want to we be very cautious and, and watchful here. Can, but can you tell me which seven houses are? No, I, I don't have that information. Yes, sir. Governor, last week I asked you about the church in Central that had yeah. service. Today there are reports that they had service again with over a thousand people at their service. What's your response to that? Well, uh, first of all, my response is to reinforce what I've said here uh, today. If you look at this chart and the other ones that, that we've, sh we've shown you, including the fact that we have the highest um, case number per capita in the in third highest in the country. Um, and, and you see that the, the rate at which our cases are growing compared to Italy and Spain and so forth. Uh, we need everybody. We need everybody, especially every leader, whether they are an elected leader, a community leader, a faith leader. We need everybody to embrace uh, these mitigation measures and to be part of the solution, not part of the problem. Um, and and it, again, it's, it's my hope that citizens will take this uh, seriously and do their part and that leaders take it even more seriously because their part uh, is even bigger it's more important um, so you know I haven't I haven't gotten that report uh, prior to to this particular question that you asked uh, it, if it's true obviously I'm disappointed and I would I would urge uh, that faith leader and, and all others uh, to heed this directive and not unnecessarily um, engage in, in mass gatherings where this coronavirus uh, can spread uh, and continue to do what, what we've shown is, is actually happening in Louisiana. Yes, sir. Uh, Governor, you said you had a call with uh, VP Mike Pence yeah. and Dr. Fauci just right before this, and they talking about these efforts while you were mulling this yeah. over. What did they say over the phone? Well, no, well, the, the conversation actually happened on Friday. Oh, on Friday. Uh, because we were already looking ahead to what additional mitigation measures we might have to take, what they would be, and under what circumstances uh, would I make this decision. Um, and so I reached out to the vice president's team. He called me back. I let him know where we were uh, on a number of areas. Um, and, and, of course, he expressed his support uh, for, for what we've been doing here in Louisiana. Um, and then he made it uh, possible through his team for me to actually have a conversation with Dr. Fauci. Uh, we then went over what was the um, case count on Friday night relative to total tests administered, what the positive number of cases were, where they were clustered, the mitigation measures that we had already put in place and when, um, and the additional mitigation measures that, that we, we believe might be necessary. And then he just, uh, in general terms, gave me, gave me some things to look for if the, if the trends continued, then statewide action on a stay-at-home basis. Uh, would be necessary sometime around Monday. Well, we don't have to wait till tomorrow now to know um, that, that we need to pull this trigger based on the information that I just showed you. Um, but it's also been done in coordination with uh, the folks here in Louisiana um, and the Department of Health, uh, particularly the Office of Public Health, Dr. B.U., uh, and others uh, about what we're doing and in consultation with other local leaders. So I've had the opportunity to personally um, brief uh, the Speaker of the House and the President of the Senate uh, and others about the, the measures that, that I'm putting into place. So, so that's, that's how this happened. Um, but, but the decision is obviously mine. Um, I am making the decision today. I've issued the order. Um, and again, it's effective at 5 o'clock tomorrow uh, because the City of New Orleans basically did this on Friday. It remains the hottest spot, but we know that we, we now have spread across the state of Louisiana. 
Um, but nobody should wait until 5 o'clock tomorrow to be a good and responsible citizen. Uh, but we knew that any time you have an order of this magnitude that affects such a large percentage of our population and a large number of our businesses out there and, and workers, uh, that we wanted an opportunity to, to be able to disseminate information, answer questions, engage in industry-specific, business-specific uh, conversations so that everyone uh, would know exactly what the order does and what it doesn't do uh, so that they can they can come into compliance with it uh, just as soon as possible. Maximizing compliance and minimizing confusion uh, is, is incredibly important, and so this is the route that I elected to take. Yes, sir. I want to know, you have 36 parishes that have reported the virus. You have 28 that haven't. What would you tell those people to have to prevent them from getting to that false sense of, of security that they won't? Yeah, well, first of all, um, there's every reason to believe that just because they don't have a positive case as, uh, as confirmed through a, a lab test, they do have coronavirus in their par parishes. I, I am certain of that. And coronavirus is present in all of the 36 parishes to a degree that exceeds the number who have actually tested positive. I mean, we know that. We know that a, a good percentage of these people are asymptomatic or only very mildly symptomatic. Uh, but they, they, they are uh, capable, especially once they become uh, symptomatic, even mildly, of spreading uh, this virus. And so nobody, nobody should, should look at the map uh, and say, whoa, well, it's not in my parish yet. I don't have anything to worry about. And that is the mindset that other, other places fell into, uh, for example, in Italy, when they said, okay, we've got a problem, but it's all in one region of the country up in the northern uh, Lombardy region of Italy. And so that's where we're going to take action. And before they knew it, it's, it's all over the country. So we cannot, it, look, we have to try to do the best we can, but we've got to learn from the experience of others as well. And all of this takes, uh, plays a part in the decisions that we make. So nobody should take this lightly. I don't care who you are or where you live in the state of Louisiana. Yes, sir. Have, has your office heard uh, about how many people, if any, have recovered yet? And if yeah. not, how long it might be until those figures start coming out? Yeah, well, we are, uh, obviously, we don't have a, of an official figure yet on those individuals who have recovered. Um, and, and recovery means you've been diagnosed uh, through a positive test that you have COVID-19. And then at some point subsequent to that, uh, you have to test negative twice with at least 24 hours separating those two tests. Um, now, typically you've got a 14 day run uh, before you would even have that first test. Well, we've only been about 13 days since we reported the first case in the state of Louisiana. So, so we're, we're not there yet. Um, I can tell you that, that we will have uh, soon people who are recovered and, and we, we are obviously thankful for that. And, and we're, we're thankful that the vast majority of people who get this virus are going to recover. Um, but we don't have those figures yet for the reasons that I just mentioned. Um, and, and, but we will, you will start seeing those reports in, in the coming days. I don't know exactly when. We will start telling you as we're able to determine the exact number of people in Louisiana who have recovered uh, from COVID-19. Yes, sir. Do you have any numbers as far as how many people are hospitalized? Um, we, we have numbers um, that, that around the state of Louisiana, I don't have them with me. Um, I will try to get that uh, to you. Uh, and by the way, this is an important point. And because we have to try to figure out what is the hospitalization rate for COVID-19 positive, uh, COVID positive uh, patients. Uh, once they have this test result, what percentage are actually going to require hospitalization? We know that the, the vast majority of the tests administered, uh, especially through the, the health lab, were for individuals who were already in the hospital. So we know that, that those numbers are going to be skewed early on uh, because, because a high percentage of those people were in the hospital. But as multiple uh, other uh, testing labs uh, come online with, with high throughput, and we test a lot more individuals, uh, many of whom are not in the hospital, I think you're going to see that rate uh, go down to, to approximately what it is in other states. And I'm, I'm reading 23, 24% is what uh, New York, uh, California, um, I think it's Illinois and some, some other states are experiencing. I cannot tell you that's where we're at in Louisiana right now, but that's why it's important to know that. 
we will get you the information uh, about the, the COVID positive, uh, the number of COVID positive uh, patients in our hospitals just as soon as I can. Yes, sir. Uh, Governor, our state has been through a number of tragedies and countless tra mm -hmm. tragedies, and you've had the opportunity to lead us past a lot of those. Is this the toughest one for you yet? Well, it's it's tough for a lot of reasons. One, it's it's not one that, that I'm personally accustomed to, but it's not one that anybody in the state of Louisiana is accustomed to. I, the last time that I'm aware of that something like this happened would have been in 1918. The governor was rough and pleasant, and they're just, he didn't leave behind a playbook. Um, but, but there's another reason why this one is particularly um, hard, and that is for our natural disasters, uh, typically you have some small part of the country that's adversely impacted and the rest of the country and the federal government can marshal resources and personnel dollars and they can respond pretty quickly and generously and they always have and we very much appreciate that. In this case, this fight has taken place simultaneously all across the country. And so from where are we going to get more doctors and nurses? I can't put out an EMAC request and have other states send me 2 million N95 masks. I can't all of a sudden go out there and buy 5,000 ventilators. That's what makes this one very, very tough. Um, and, and I will tell you that uh, I hope that, that we can get to a different, a different place nationally soon as to how PPE and ventilators are being managed um, because quite frankly, Louisiana cannot compete with New York and its purchasing power uh, when it comes to, and, and of course, New York isn't getting what they're needing right now either. But we have every hospital, every state trying to go to manufacturers and vendors of this PPE, um, and, and we're all trying to access what happens to be in a national stockpile. This is the one area where I hope the federal government pretty soon will figure out a more constructive role that it can play in terms of procuring and allocating out uh, PPE ventilators and so forth uh, in accordance with, with some sort of a distribution um, uh, metric that makes sense. Again, I, every time I, I speak with our federal partners, including the vice president, the president, I make sure they know where our per capita case count is. I know, I make sure they know what our trajectory is. Um, so, so this is something that we continue to work on. We are literally trying to source PPE all over the world right here from this building. Uh, it is a difficult thing to do. We do have PPE coming in and not in the numbers uh, or with the frequency that we would like, uh, but it's something we continue to work on. And I do know that our manufacturers gonna, are ramping up production. There's going to be some lag time before those, those items do get produced and get put into the supply chain and so forth, uh, but, but it makes it very difficult. And, and so th this particular emergency is very different and in many, many ways much harder uh, than, than previous emergencies for the reasons that I just mentioned and probably for a host of reasons that uh, at the moment escape me. Yes, sir. Well, on the state government shutdown or whatever we're kind of causing it, last week you had work at home but had trouble finding enough laptops for the folks working yeah. at home and finding enough VPN access into the state system. Have those? Wh where does that stand now? And if I can't get a laptop, can I just stay home if I'm a state employee? Well, state employees, uh, I'm, I'm not going to communicate to state employees through the media about whether they're to stay home. We're going to do that through the state agencies and the agency heads. Um, and so they, they will know if they're to go to work and if so, where they're to report or whether they're to stay at home. Uh, we are ramping up our capacity for people to be able to work from home. It was. Uh, a number of state employees already had that capacity. We're increasing that capacity over time, uh, but essential state uh, government functions will remain open, whether they're done from the offices or not, or, or from home um, uh, will depend on what those agencies' capabilities and needs are. We are closing state offices as it relates to interaction with the public. Uh, but but I really I really don't want to try to communicate with my state workers through the media. We're going to do that directly uh, through agency heads. Yes, sir. Um, I, we're looking at 50 different states dealing with this right now, but we're talking about 50 different governors dealing with it on different levels. Yeah. Can our neighboring states screw things up for us? 
Well, look, uh, I have a lot of confidence in all of our state uh, and all of the state governors. We, we are on conference calls several times a week. Um, not every state has the same um, uh, degree or concentration of cases and, and, and growth in cases and so forth. Um, but, but we're all facing the same challenges and, and what we see today, our neighbors could see next week. And so we're learning from one another. Um, for example, I've had conversations with, with multiple other governors, including the governor of Mississippi, Tate Reeves, um, and so forth. And, and uh, you know, we, we do want, it's helpful if every state, uh, it's obviously helpful if every state is engaging in very significant, robust mitigation measures because no state has closed its borders to another state, right? And because the goods and commerce that keep our stores open, they're coming from all over the, the country. Uh, so, so this is a nationwide effort, um, but I have a lot of confidence in, in, our, in, in my fellow governors and, and in the work that they are doing, and, and we're gonna get through uh, this together. Yes, sir. What about daycare facilities? How does yeah. your order impact those? Yeah, so, so those daycares, um, early learning centers, uh, can stay open, but they need to do so in accordance with the instructions and directives they're being given by the Department of Education and by the Department of Health. Um, and and we, we do understand that this can be challenging. Um, and it's, it's one of those places where we have to strike the right balance because we need to make sure at a minimum uh, that our healthcare workers can go to work. And some of them can't if they don't have daycare, for example. So, so uh, they, we are working with the Department of Health and with the Department of Education to provide directives uh, as to which early learning centers should stay open and how they should, should operate. And so we're asking the early learning centers to plug into uh, the Departments of Health and Education. Yes, sir. There is so much uncertainty in the last week. A lot has happened. And even with all of your warnings, a lot of people in your state are living in fear right now. Yeah. What do you say to those people who are in that state of fear? Well, first of all, I, I don't think fear and panic are helpful, but being serious and understanding that, that we need to have a sense of urgency, you know, those things are helpful. Uh, we, we, want, we want people to take this seriously. We want people to comply. Um, look, this is in many ways mysterious because it's the novel coronavirus. There's a lot that we don't know about it. We don't have immunity to it. There is no vaccine. As of right now, I don't think there's an approved therapeutic treatment for it. But there are some things we know. You catch this from contact with other people, either, either because there are droplets in the air uh, or because there are droplets on the surface that you come into contact with. Uh, and so minimizing contact uh, between people uh, is the is the most effective way to slow the spread. And then the additional things, and I, I didn't mention all these today, but they, they still remain really, really important. You know, wash your hands for, for at least 20 seconds with soap and water. Use hand sanitizer if you can't get the soap and water. Control your cough. Don't go anywhere if you're sick. Stay six feet away. Practice social distancing. Uh, those things are still incredibly important. Uh, so, so I want people to understand that they shouldn't, they, they shouldn't have, they shouldn't be paralyzed by fear and they shouldn't be motivated by panic to do things that don't bear a rational relationship to the situation. But I'm telling you what you can do. I am telling you what it is rational for you to do in this situation and I'm asking that you do that. And don't just do it for yourself. Do it for your neighbor. Do it for the healthcare workers. Yes, sir. You spoke to the legislature right before coming in. Here. I what spoke to the speaker day? and to the president. Uh, and so, so Clay Sex Snyder, Speaker of the House, uh, Senate President uh, Paige Cortez, and we are having, um, I don't know if it's going on right now, but very soon we're going to be having a conference call uh, with all rank and file legislators just basically having the same conversation with them that I'm having with you right now so that they understand uh, why we're taking uh, this action, why I believe it's necessary, uh, what they can do to help uh, with respect to making sure that, that more people um, um, do as they're, they're being uh, directed. Uh, and, uh, you know, we also still have to find a way um, between now and June the 30th to get enough legislation done so that our state can continue to function on July 1st. 
Uh, and so I had a conversation with them about all of these things this morning. I appreciate uh, the degree to which they were engaged uh, and, and they were knowledgeable of the situation. And quite frankly, to the degree to which they supported the action that I am announcing right now. Yes, sir. And I, a couple more questions. Uh, uh, three more questions here, here, and here in that order. Yes, sir. Um, does this stay at home order include a curfew at this time? It does not. Um, it, that is something we, we could do later. And, and, you know, every parish government has the ability to do that now. Um, and uh, we've, we've uh, equipped the uh, sheriffs of each parish as a chief law enforcement officer of the parish with the authority to do that by virtue of an earlier proclamation because what we want to make sure is that, uh, that they can conserve their resources too. And so if they're particularly challenged and they don't have to have 24 hour service, uh, uh, service uh, to the degree that they currently do. I mean, I can, I, no parish is gonna go any period of time without having law enforcement on the street. But if there's something they can do with a curfew that helps them uh, to better serve the public um, and if it's necessary for uh, to maintain order or to, pro to promote, protect public safety, then they're, they're able to do that. I'm not doing that in this order. Yes, sir. A lot of people on our Facebook are asking about car dealerships and getting their vehicle serviced. Is that considered a non-essential or so, essential? Sir, well, first of all, I'm encouraging, every, and I know this is not a satisfactory answer. There is an exhaustive list under that CISA um, uh, reference that I made. Then go look there. I can tell you that... Uh, uh, automobile repair shops, including those that are attached to a part of dealerships, will remain open. Yes, sir. Oh, yeah. Um, cool, cool, cool. Uh, just, you said I didn't get a chance to look at that list. Are daycares considered non essential? Well, I, I just answered about uh, daycares. And, and what we're asking daycares to do is to consult with the Department of Education, consult with the Department of, of, of uh, Health, Office of Public Health, and, and we're going to be getting information out. Uh, to them. I'm encouraging everyone to visit gov.la.gov uh, to answer more questions. We're going we're gonna to upload, that site has information now. Every time there are changes made, we're going to be sending people there, gov.la.gov, um, and, and uh, we will spend uh, whatever time, make whatever effort is necessary to, to make sure people understand this order, uh, and what they can do, what they can't do, uh, and so forth. And look, I, my, my final comments today are just going to be directed directly to the, the people of our state. This is a serious situation. Uh, I am asking for maximum adherence, compliance uh, to these directives that we've gone, we've gone through today. Uh, and we don't have time. We can't wait uh, till next week. We can't figure out whether in two weeks from now, because that's just not the nature of pandemics. Uh, we, we have to act now. Uh, I'm asking you to do everything that you can uh, to make sure that you are not out there spreading this virus, not only for yourself, uh, but for your neighbors, particularly those who are, who are most vulnerable. Uh, so I, I'm asking everybody to do their part. We are going to be successful, but we're going to be successful because people do what they're being asked to do. Um, and the sooner we, we engage it um, uh, together uh, and this the sooner we're, we're going to get past this and the better uh, that we're going to be able to manage uh, this particular emergency. Uh, so I thank everybody for the cooperation thus far, uh, but it is going to have to get better. I encourage everyone to be patient and I encourage everyone uh, to be prayerful. God bless and thank you.